Andrea Levy is a PhD in history from Concordia University. Ecology remains her primary focus of interest as an independent scholar, journalist, and editor. She has published essays and lectured on ecology as a social movement, on the intersections between ecology and peace, on eco-socialism, and on degrowth. Her other research ideas include the nature of work and precarious labor, and the intellectual history of the new left. A member of the editorial collective of uh, Canadian Dimension for the last 15 years, she coordinated the magazine's special issue on degrowth in 2012. She is the author of Ecocide, uh, a regular co column on vanishing biodiversity and other environmental tragedies. Uh, Andrea is also a member of uh, Critique, uh, a collective of uh, uh, research and interdisciplinary, um, oh, this is in French. Um, sur les imp impasses de la croissance. So I guess the impasses of, uh, of growth, I'm guessing. Uh, poorly translated, I bet. Uh, as a member of the editorial board of uh, French language journal Les Nouveaux Cahiers uh, du Socialisme. Um, please lend a hand in welcoming Andrea Levy to the stage. So thanks very much, everybody, for being here. Um, I think Dr. Sturgeon is gone, which is too bad, because I'm about to disagree with her pretty vehemently about our having moved beyond the opposition of environmentalism versus jobs. <laughs> but uh, we can argue about it later. So I think my, uh, my abstract got lost in the, in the electronic shuffle, but the title of my talk is Prometheus Unwound, the Ecological Imperative of Work Time Reduction. With uh, tedious predictability, Governments throughout the global north trumpet job creation as their priority. Our government will continue to create the conditions for new and better jobs for Canadians across all sectors of our economy, promised Stephen Harper in his throne speech two weeks ago. In the voiceover accompanying her recent TV ad campaign, Ontario's new premier declared, whether it's on the farm or on the factory floor, whether it's a starting point or your dream, it's a job. I'm Kathleen Wynne, and it's my job to create more of them. The NDP's recipe is job creation, Tom Mulcair proclaimed at the NDP convention in April. It is the first priority in a sustainable economy. By contrast, one of the more surprising news items I read this year was a press release from the Canadian Labour Congress reporting new research that revealed that the importation of migrant workers accounted for a majority of the new jobs created in Canada from 2008 to 2011. And about 75%, mark that figure, of all the new jobs created in Canada in 2010 and 2011. This at a time when 1.4 million Canadian residents were unemployed. That's mostly a policy choice, by the way. The uh, temporary foreign worker program has shifted over the years towards low-skill occupations in a trend that Jason Foster compares to Europe's guest worker phenomenon. So it has less to do now with not being able to find qualified Canadian residents and more to do with paying low wages. Everyone here is undoubtedly aware of the various recent allegations of resident workers being outright replaced by cheaper temporary foreign workers from information technology employees at the Royal Bank to pipe fitters and welders at the tar sands. And the growth of temporary foreign workers is one example of a broader shift in this country towards non-standard employment since the 1980s. When you tally up all the people working part-time on contracts seasonally and as freelancers, we're talking now about roughly 40% of the working population. And most of them don't enjoy the social benefits such as pension plans and sick leave associated with the traditional full-time job. An article in the Globe and Mail last February reported that just half of the people working in the greater Toronto and Hamilton areas have permanent full-time jobs that provide benefits and stability. Everyone else, writes Susan McIsaac and Charlotte Yates, is working in situations that are part-time, vulnerable, or insecure in some way. And in addition to the expansion of contingent and precarious work, there are lots of people who just can't find work at all. The official unemployment rate is still 1% higher now than it was before the financial crisis. And that's not counting those job seekers who have given up, or the underemployed and, voluntary, and involuntary part-timers. The proportion of long-term unemployed has almost doubled 
in the last five years. In this context of the ongoing destabilization of work, it's easy for corporations and their political allies to cynically pit the environment against job creation, promoting environmentally disastrous projects as precious job generators, and justifying both environmental and labor deregulation on the grounds that nothing must be allowed to interfere with creating a favorable climate for investments which will purportedly produce jobs. Bill C-45, the omnibus bill that gutted environmental regulation in this country last year, is officially called the Jobs and Growth Act. And the widespread insecurity surrounding employment helps them turn the trick, however inflated the claims. Take the Keystone Pipeline, for example. TransCanada's trump card in promoting that project was the claim that it will create 20,000 jobs, in this instance in the United States. But one study by Cornell University Global Labor Institute reported that the pipeline project would add only 500 to 1,400 temporary construction jobs. And when the company was called out on its dubious methods of estimating the job potential, it revised its figures dramatically downward. The mining sector offers another example. The Mining Association of Canada vaunts the virtues of the growth of the mining industry, claiming it will hire more than 100,000 additional workers in the next decade. But then we hear stories like the one about the Murray River coal mine in BC, where HD mining is bringing in temporary foreign workers, in this instance Chinese miners, to do the work of building and operating the mine for at least five years. So however much corporations talk about creating jobs, the logic of the capitalist system pulls squarely in the other direction. Capital is driven to reduce labor costs by any available means, introducing productivity boosting and labor saving technology, exporting jobs to low wage countries, stripping jobs of costly social benefits through reliance on contingent labor, and impeding union organizing in various ways. This is part of what accounts for the steady decline over the last four decades in labor's share of national income throughout the global north. In an article for Reuters, economics correspondent Alan Wheatley discusses an international labor organization study indicating that in 16 developed countries, labor's share of national income dropped from about 75% on average in the 1970s to 65% just before the financial crisis. The ILO also found that labor productivity has increased more than twice as much as average wages since 1999. Wheatley also notes the ILO's explanation for the apparent discrepancy, which is confirmed by analysts like Paul Krugman in the US, namely that the surplus is going to the owners of capital, notably in the form of much higher dividends. The Occupy Wall Street movement contributed enormously to making it common knowledge that the economic gains from growth, whether during periods of slow or rapid growth, are everywhere being captured by the 1%. At the end of 2009, 3.8% of Canadian households controlled 67% of total household wealth. So the rising tide, proverbially said to lift all boats, looks increasingly like an ecological tsunami in which most vessels are in any event floundering. But to return to my main point, particularly in Canada, the growth of the extractive economy is being marketed as the remedy to a flaccid job market. And the promise of jobs will always win out over even the most urgent needs for environmental protection, even though that promise is frequently a false one. And what we are witnessing is an unrelenting attack on the majority of actual and would-be job holders with the erosion of workers' protection and the repeal of some of the historic gains of labor, as in the recent raising of retirement age. Governments and corporations all sing the siren song of job creation to wed us to infinite growth at any cost, as if there is no alternative. But there are other options, even without displacing wage work as the primary means of access to income, at least in the medium term. There is the reduction of working time. Work time reduction is one viable approach to the problem of more equitably distributing work, and by extension, the income and benefits that are today accessible principally through paid employment. And it is arguably the structural reform poised to translate the concept of degrowth into practice, since by reducing the amount of time people spend in wage work, it liberates us for the productive and creative activity essential to a vision of sustainable degrowth. In practice, degrowth has to entail a collective downscaling. It implies consuming less and doing more. It means shortening circuits of production and distribution and reclaiming at least some activities from the realm of the market in a return to various forms of localized informal production. 
It implies a way of life which will require more time than the hours left over from demanding wage work. And that wealth of time, together with greater individual and collective autonomy and self-reliance, is also arguably the reward that degrowth can offer. Time for personal development, for personal relationships, for community involvement. In a word, sustainable degrowth will demand more activity and less employment. This morning I want to make three main points about work time reduction. It can have concrete and direct environmental benefits. It can expand the constituency for a project of sustainable degrowth through its potential appeal to several key constituencies. That's something that Andreas was talking about in his introduction. And it is in principle feasible. My first line of argument is that work time reduction makes sense as a cent central strategy of any degrowth scenario because it has an empirically demonstrable positive environmental impact. There's a growing interest in the intersection between working time and the environment that's reflected in the publication of a number of studies over the last few years. As economists, you may want to grapple with the fine points of the methodologies, which unfortunately elude me, but the findings are very suggestive, so I'd like to share those with you. A study published this year by David Rosnick of the Washington-based Center for Economic and Policy Research estimated remarkably that reducing working time would eliminate about one quarter to one half of the global warming that he refers to as not already locked in, that is warming that would be caused by greenhouse gas concentrations already in the atmosphere. Rosnick found that an annual 0.5% reduction in work hours would cut every degree of warming by between 8 and 22% as shorter hours result in lower production. That 0.5% decrease in work hours annually would bring the average work week down from 40 to 30 hours by 2100, with seven additional weeks of vacation, which sounds quite tempting. And a previous study by two Swedish scholars also found that variations in work time have a clear impact on energy use and GHG emissions, although not as marked an impact as that estimated by Rosnick. According to uh, their study of Swedish households, a 1% decrease in working hours leads, on average, to a 0.89% reduction in energy use of GHG emissions, whereas longer hours increased those impacts. The likelihood of a favorable environmental impact of reduced working time was recently analyzed by Kyle Knight, Eugene Rosa, and Juliet Shore in a paper that considered the impact of shorter hours on ecological footprint, carbon footprint, and carbon dioxide emissions. Looking at data from 29 high-income OECD countries, the study's authors corroborated their hypothesis that, quote, a reduction in working hours in developed countries could be a significant contributor to reduced environmental pressures through downward impacts on both the scale of economic activity and the environmental intensity of consumption patterns. So what they're arguing there is that longer work hours place higher demands on resources by contributing to the expansion of the scale of economic output and consequently generating more waste and pollution. But beyond the issue of scale of output, they point out other ways in which longer hours are environmentally deleterious. Confirming the old adage, haste makes waste, they conclude that time pressures lead to consumption choices that are relatively worse for the environment. So if you're in a hurry, you're, uh, you're less likely to take a bus than to take a taxi. You're likelier to reach for processed foods than to cook yourself a meal. You're likelier to replace something broken than to repair it. And uh, that, in fact, confirms another study that was conducted in France that demonstrated an association between longer work hours and greater consumption of environmentally intensive goods. There's a, a glitch in this, which is, the, and the researchers acknowledge it, and various commentators have pointed it out, that the extent of the environmental impact of reduced working hours will depend in part on the, the degree to which any time that's liberated is in turn expended in resource-intensive uh, resource consumption. In other words, if you're... Um, if you're going to spend your free time flying in airplanes, you're not going to be uh, reducing GHG emissions. So it depends on the choices that are made, which is a cultural and political question. But um, the hypothesis that shorter hours results in reduced carbon emissions was tested in practice on a small scale in Utah with a 2008 pilot program that involved shutting down 1,000 government buildings on Fridays and shifting about three quarters of the 17,000 full-time state workers to a four-day, 10-hour work schedule. Instituted primarily as a cost-saving measure, this was a rearrangement that, rather than a reduction of hours, but the environmental impact was significant, resulting in a 10.5% reduction in energy consumption in the first year due to savings in heating, air conditioning, and lighting, and a reduction of 
10,040 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions, factoring in both the office closure and the one-day decrease in commuting. Tellingly, too, the program was very popular with employees, a vast majority of whom were happy with the new schedule. And the affected state workers also saved millions collectively by not commuting. But the four-day work week was ultimately scrapped in 2011 because the government found that it wasn't saving as much money as it hoped since energy, energy prices had fallen. So that's an example of the Jevons paradox at work. <laughs> uh, but the Utah experiment brings me to my next point, one that's, I think, too often overlooked in a society that has been shaped by the neoliberal dictum that there is no alternative. Work time reduction is a viable structural reform that can point us past the logic and strictures of the prevailing system in the direction of sustainable degrowth. Whether you view that transition as feasible within the framework of a capitalist system, or whether you believe that convivial and sustainable degrowth necessarily entails economic arrangements incompatible with capitalism and its growth imperative. Let's remember that the work week we take for granted today was the product of intense struggle and the fight for shorter hours was met with obdurate opposition on the part of employers. Just to take a little digression into Canadian labor history, here in Toronto, in March of 1872, the Toronto Printers Union went on strike for a nine hour workday, six days a week. And their action gained the support of other workers with 10,000 people descending on Queen's Park. The publishers brought in scabs, had the strike leaders arrested, and wielded the blacklist, which actually originated as a list of union members to be barred from employment. One of the fiercest opponents of the nine-hour day was one of the fathers of Confederation, George Brown, editor of the Globe newspaper, the forerunner of the Globe and Mail, and by the way, a liberal prison reformer and anti-slavery advocate. He claimed shorter hours would be bad for labor and called on employers to, quote, shut their works and starve the men into submission should the agitation for the nine hours continue. The nine hour day was denounced by others as communist leveling. Of course, while that movement was defeated, the protracted battle for the nine hour day was eventually won. But the struggle for an historic trend towards shorter hours that prevailed during the 19th century and first half of the 20th waned for a variety of reasons as consumption tended to trump free time with the result that work time began to stagnate in the second half of the 20th century. As Juliet Shore and others have shown, gains in productivity have not translated into reductions in working time. The trend towards declining per capita hours worked ceased and in some instances reversed. In Canada, average weekly working hours across industries and occupations have remained in the 35 to 40 hour range since the mid 1960s. If average working time in Canada had kept decreasing at the same pace as it did in the first decades of the 20th century, the work week now would be considerably shorter than the nearly 40 hours per week on average that full-time employed Canadians currently spend at work. But my point here is that work time is a moving target. Even if we look at the issue strictly synchronically, there are considerable differences in working time in different parts of the global north, leading scholars like Knight, Rosa, and Shore to conclude quote, that work time is a malleable structural factor that could be adjusted by willing governments in order to reduce the scale of natural resource consumption, end quote. And in truth, it has been adjusted, but not for the right reasons and not in the right way. The entire move towards flexibilization, which has resulted in precariousness and polarization of working time, was undergirded by policy decisions. It's a question, like so much else, of political will. There have been a variety of experiments with working time in the global north since the 1930s. The famous Kellogg six hour day and the United States almost legislated a sharp reduction in working time during the Great Depression when Democratic Senator Hugo Black of Alabama introduced the 30 hour workweek bill which actually came close to passing. And more recently there was the introduction of the French 35 hour week and the Dutch emphasis on part time schedules. The Netherlands is the country that has perhaps done the most to promote shorter hours as an equitable solution to unemployment. During the 1980s, Dutch labor unions agreed to restrain their wage demands to fight inflation, and in exchange, businesses agreed to provide more early retirement plans and part-time jobs with comparable wages and benefits in order to reduce unemployment by sharing the work. As a result, the proportion of part-time workers increased from 21% in 1983 to 36.5% in 1996. Rudd Lubbers, the Prime Minister when these policies were being implemented, stressed the benefits to human well-being, explaining, it is true that the Dutch are not aiming to maximize gross national product per capita. 
Rather, we are seeking to attain a high quality of life, a just, participatory, and sustainable society. While the Dutch economy is very efficient per working hour, the number of working hours per citizen are rather limited. We like it that way. Needless to say, there is more room for all those important aspects of our lives that are not part of our jobs, for which we are not paid, and for which there is never enough time. Now, I can't imagine Stephen Harper saying something like that. <laughs> all these experiments remind us that we shouldn't let present realities obscure and preempt future possibilities. Working time is historically fluid. It's a social and political decision, not some unalterable economic fact. And it's on the basis of social, economic, and environmental arguments that several scholars at the New Economics Foundation in Britain adduced an argument for a 21-hour week. The 21 hours proposal derives from their calculation of the average amount of time people actually spend in paid employment. Currently, those hours are unevenly distributed between men and women and between various age groups and social categories, but it averages out to about 21, in the UK anyway. The uh, New Economics Foundation doesn't fetishize the idea of a 20, 21 hour work week per se. What they suggest is exploring various ways of spreading 1,092 hours over 12 months, which can be done in different ways. And by the way, in uh, Peter Victor's compelling argument for the feasibility of sustainable degrowth, Canadians would be working somewhat more than what the NEF proposes. Uh, he suggests a four-day week, but that would probably diminish over time. Um, to my mind, what makes work time reduction particularly attractive as the iconic reform for the degrowth movement is that the virtues of shorter hours have been recognized by many constituencies at various times. As a central part of a degrowth social project, this proposition dovetails, of course, with the historic demand of the labor movement. As long as jobs remain the principal means, however flawed, of distributing income, the promise of jobs ties labor to the growth imperative. But work time reduction can help loosen that bond. While it's true that the trade union movement, which has been contending with a steady onslaught of anti-union and anti-worker initiatives over the last few decades, has put the goal of reducing the work week on the back burner, the aim of shorter hours has not been eclipsed. As Mark Thomas points out in a paper on union strategies around working time, shorter hours continues to be a central policy objective of the labor movement, although in practice the goal is usually to reduce hours by indirect means, such as reduced overtime, early retirement, longer vacations, and by negotiating various types of parental and compassionate leave and so on, rather than aiming for the direct reduction of the work week. Thomas's observations are borne out by the collective bargaining and political action program published by the CAW last summer prior to its merger with the CAP that created Unifor. The program contained a section on working time that emphasizes the ongoing struggles around reducing and regulating working time and places the emphasis on bargaining for more vacation and leave time, for example, and also on the issue of unpaid overtime, which has become a serious problem in Canada, with roughly 20% of the workforce now putting in an average of nearly 8.5 hours of unpaid overtime each week. Unpaid overtime has actually surpassed paid overtime in recent years, and there's a significant gender disparity here, as men's overtime is typically paid, while women's is typically unpaid. The dollar value of that unpaid overtime has been variously estimated at anywhere from 15 to 21 billion dollars annually. Consider how many jobs that could create. In a 2002 paper for the journal Just Labor, Julie White of the Communications Energy and Paper Workers Union crunched some numbers and concluded that total overtime, paid and unpaid, amounted to 20 million hours a week, or the equivalent of 500,000 full-time jobs. And total overtime appears to have remained on the rise in the second decade of the new millennium. So it would be interesting to update that calculation, which is something economists should be working on. In championing shorter hours, then, advocates of degrowth can conceivably cultivate a wider audience and build alliances not only by connecting with this historic demand of the labor movement, but also by mounting a solid case for a meaning, meaningful reform that speaks to other constituencies, such as working women, for whom work-life balance tends to be a constant struggle. And young people are another group ripe for a rethinking of the employment society. The official unemployment rate for Canadian youth stands at 12.9%, down a little from the spring and summer due to young people in the 15 to 24 age category giving up on finding employment. 
Although a 15% rate may seem paltry these days when we consider Spain, Portugal, and Greece, where youth unemployment is hitting unimaginable heights like 50 and 60%, finding and keeping jobs is a number one preoccupation for young people, whether or not they are armed with university degrees. For degrowth to make inroads among the upcoming generations, it needs an inspiring vision of the transformation of work and leisure, an entry point to which is the proposal for a general reduction of working time. Young people already know that the full-time job with benefits for life is a relic of another era, and that they can look forward to precariousness and what David Graeber, an, anth an anthropologist at the London School of Economics, recently dubbed bullshit jobs referring essentially to the expansion of paid employment in administration, surveillance, and marketing. A world without teachers or dock workers would soon be in trouble, Graeber suggests, and even one without science fiction writers or ska musicians would clearly be a lesser place. But it's not entirely clear, he continues, how humanity would suffer were all private equity CEOs, lobbyists, PR researchers, actuaries, telemarketers, bailiffs, or legal consultants to similarly vanish. More to the point, however, so many of today's coveted jobs revolve around promoting the overconsumption that underpins so much of what ails us ecologically. Is work time reduction a utopian idea? I think we should start responding to this offhand indictment by dwelling on all the dystopian ideas that pass as propositions worth entertaining these days, like dumping vast amounts of iron into the oceans to produce phytoplankton explosions. I recently read a disturbing scenario that I fear mainstream economists may welcome, that we can boost labor productivity by cutting the amount we sleep through the use of drugs such as modafinil, which could enable people to sleep as little as two and a half hours per night without compromising their mental acuity. As the second largest single use of time after wage work, sleep is the realm one sociology blogger sees as ripe for colonization by the employment society. By his calculations, it could increase the number of hours an American worker spends at work annually from about 1,800 to 2,400, a 34% increase. Honestly, when I read this, I thought it was a joke until I realized that it wasn't. And he does all these calculations. He suggests that it will benefit firms by allowing them to achieve the same output with fewer workers working longer hours. They can hugely reduce costs, he argues, by spreading the fixed cost per worker over more hours of work. More hours worked shouldn't increase costs of health care, training, and fringe benefits, so the fixed costs fall in line with their reduced workforce. By increasing the labor supply, the blogger argues, a rapid introduction of these sleep-saving drugs would cause a fall in hourly wages, but that's okay because people would earn more because they'd be working longer hours. He even maintains that it would be environmentally friendly because it would reduce the fixed carbon outputs per workday, primarily through reductions in commuting, resulting from the ability of companies to employ fewer workers. So this whole thing put me in mind of a meditation on Keynes's 1930 essay, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, in which uh, Robert and Edward Skidelsky opined that degrowth advocates would do well to dwell less on the ecological downside of limitless growth than on its sheer absurdity. In an essay on climate change, capitalism, and limits to growth, John Barry observes that ideas about growth derived from neoclassical economics exercise a cultural hegemony. Rather than being rightly viewed as a convention rooted in a particular historic form of economic organization subject to change, they're seen as the very fabric of reality, just common sense. And just as ideas about the growth model have been naturalized, so have ideas about work. As Kathy Weeks observes in her excellent study, The Problem with Work, the current arrangements of work and its distribution, which are functional to the development and current stage of capitalism, are normalized and moralized so that we fail to see them simply as one way, and perhaps not the best one, of organizing productive activity and producing social wealth. The whole notion of convivial degrowth rests on the idea that while it is desirable for ecological, social, and ethical reasons, it's also likely inevitable. So the real question becomes how to manage degrowth sustainably and equitably rather than leaving the market to sort out the fallout. Similarly, work time reduction is in fact happening now 
through such mechanisms as computerization, the extension of educational requirements that delays the entry of young people into paid employment, and flexibilization policies that have spurred the growth of temporary and part-time employment. And that trend is looking even more certain with the rapid advance of technological innovation that is rendering obsolete entire categories of workers, especially those in what are called routine intensive jobs, and increasingly those in low-skilled jobs, to the point that a widely reported Oxford University study published this fall, which sought to quantify the impact of computerization on the future of employment, concluded that 47% of US jobs are potentially at risk within two decades. And another study by a fellow by the name of Ford called Lights in the Tunnel put that figure some, something like 75%. And even if these types of predictions overstate the problem by half, the scenario remains pretty dire. Although there are many reasons to espouse work reduction beyond its potential value as an antidote to massive unemployment, a dramatic reduction in working time could serve as a barrier against the tide of technological displacement. Equally important though, as the New Economics Foundation argues, moving towards a much shorter working week would help break the habit of living to work, working to earn, and earning to consume. In sum, envisioning a substantial reduction of working time is an example of what Serge Latouche has in mind when he calls on us to decolonize the imaginary. It invites us to challenge conventional thinking and to sketch out in more concrete terms the conditions for a transition to sustainable degrowth. Thanks for listening. Speed round of questions. So if uh, folks could get their hands up and uh, Ellie and uh, Andrea can take notes in terms of the questions that are addressed to them, um, uh, then please do. Uh, but then we can continue on with uh, more questions in the, the break. Um, so just, just in order, they remark about the, um, the application of work reduction being complicated. I think, I think it, it can be. On the other hand, the, uh, the Utah experiment, which was fairly dramatic, moving people from a, you know, a five-day-a-week schedule to a 17,000 people, was done by a Republican governor at a month's notice. So, you know, if there's a will, there's a way. People reorganized their lives and it worked and they were happy at the end. So I, don't, I think th the point is that we need to experiment and we shouldn't be constrained from experimentation by the notion that, oh, we can't do it, it can't be done, it's too complicated, it won't work. Those are the kinds of, you know, um, on the question of agriculture, I think that you proved my point um, in the sense that obviously uh, carbon intensive agriculture has to go, but what that means is much more labor intensive agriculture. It means small scale local farming, which we know requires a great deal more activity. Um, so I think that that makes the point exactly about the need for, uh, for reducing paid employment so that we can move on to other kinds of activities in a in a degrowth society, um, like subsistence agriculture. On the question of um, no traction outside this room, I think, uh, I think you're wrong. I think at least on the question of work reduction, there's plenty of traction outside this room. Not perhaps for the audiences you're talking about, but I'm less interested in speaking to decision makers than I am in speaking to and building social movements. And when it comes to social movements, there's a lot of traction. The green movement has been very interested in the question of work time reduction. And the labor movement, as I kept insisting in my talk, has also been very interested in the question of work time reduction. I have that pamphlet that I mentioned that the CAW put out called A Better, time, a better, a better World is Possible on Working Time. And uh, the labor movement is a big movement. And I think work time reduction is precisely one of the things that will uh, we'll be able to link notions about degrowth and the opportunities it offers with, uh, with other concerns. It's, it's too easy to think of the dim and gloom, and the opportunities are also, I think, 
think, right there. I'm going to ask you to transfer your mic. Oh, I'm aware that uh, time is, is moving on, and I just, I'd like to thank the people that uh, made, made uh, additions and comments about the, uh, about the Great Lakes Commons, the Commons-based monetary system. I want to talk to you more about that. I, I can't, I don't think I can add anything at this point to, to, uh, to that, but I, uh, I appreciate the, the, and also res sacra, that's, that's a really good point. Um, and, the, and the comment from the grassroots about how commons, as a, uh, co-ops anyway, and credit unions as, as, as entities aren't necessarily progressive unless they're nested and grouped in, a, in an alternative movement. I think that's a really good point. And that echoes what Andrea said about um, the, what is the model that we're envisioning here for how society changes. I don't believe society changes from the top down. Society changes from, from the ground up, from needs that are met by groups of people organizing together to do something in a better way. And that's the way culture changes and the culture changes lead to the political changes. So um, I think that's all I need to, to say about it. So thanks. So uh, I want uh, to give another round of applause to Ellie and Andrea. This is only the beginning uh, of today's session.